Well, this week we are continuing in our series, The Stories That Remain. This is the study of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, and I, I'm really enjoying this study a lot, just week three, so we're, we're right at the beginning of it, but there's a lot here. And of course, there is the fact that today is Palm Sunday as well. And I want to just uh, go to our thread. Let's do that right up front. Thread for our uh, day. This is the second half of last week's message. And no, we're not going to finish all the notes today either. But hey, there's good news. Uh, There's always next week. And so we're going to come back and do that. So message thread. The fear of God is still the beginning of wisdom. And our faith will follow. Now, you might recognize this part of this. This is a verse from Proverbs. Uh, Chapter one, I think it's verse seven, and it says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Well, here it still is. And we're going to really learn and understand more of this today. And our faith will follow. Now on Palm Sunday, this is the day that we commemorate Jesus, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It's at the end of his ministry. It begins the Passion Week. We know that the beginning of the Passion Week, he enters Jerusalem at the end of the Passion Week. We're going to see the cross, and we're going to see the resurrection next Sunday. Beautiful time, but there's a lot that takes place between Palm Sunday, the entrance to Jerusalem, and then the resurrection as well. A lot's going to take place in there. But today commemorates the fact that Jesus, as he was coming into Jerusalem, his followers hailed him as King of the Jews. They recognized him as Messiah. They recognized him as the One that they had all been looking for. And they took palm branches and they waved him, waved uh, them at him and before him in the procession as they are honoring him, admiring him, giving him adoration for all of his royalty, the kingship, the authority, the power, everything that goes along with it. And they would lay down their cloaks in front of him. This is what they would do in humility and showing their submission to the king. It's a beautiful scene, but it's just the followers of Jesus who were doing this. So it was a lot of people, but it wasn't all the people. It said that the priests were there as well. And of course, they said, you can't say that. <laughs> they acknowledged that he was the Messiah, that he is God-like. And they said, you can't do that. And they said, oh yeah, we can. The priest did not receive Jesus in this way. The establishment in Jerusalem did not receive Jesus in this way. Those at the temple did not receive Jesus in this way. And so we know this whole thing goes awry. But as Jesus is entering Jerusalem, he already knows all that's gonna take place. And it needs to for him to become the sacrificial lamb upon that cross, the final sacrifice that will be given for the sins of man. That has to take place. All this has to take place. And so as he's going and experiencing the procession and all of these people giving him adoration, here's what he says. As he came close to Jerusalem, he saw the city ahead and he began to weep. But how I wish today that you, Jerusalem, of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. This is a prediction 40 years Before it takes place, in A.D. 70, Jesus predicts that Jerusalem will be leveled by the Romans, and that's exactly what takes place. They will have a Jewish revolt. The Jews will revolt against Rome. Rome will come in and do what Rome does. It will crush people, and that's exactly what Rome did. And then it goes on to say, your enemies, Jesus said, will not leave a single stone in place. Hear this. They won't leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. You did not recognize it when God visited you. If you had, things would be very different. The way to peace would be found. 
I could have offered that. I was offering it, but you rejected that. The fear of God is still the beginning of wisdom and our faith will follow. I remember when I was in college, I was driving home from class one day and I was driving down Grant Line Road, which is down in the south area, Sacramento here. And I remember that I was, it was a clear day, really beautiful day. And I'm just looking ahead and I see this truck, it's a diesel truck in front of me and it's, it's a rock carrier. I used to see those all the time. And it had two trailers on it. It was pretty long and I was, I was behind it, but it was, it was quite a ways up. I'm not sure exactly how far, but I could make out what it was. There was also a motorcycle behind it. And I saw the motorcycle pull out to the left and try to pass the rock truck. And then I saw the rock truck take a hard left into a driveway. And then I thought, what am I looking at? Because this looks really bad. The next thing I know, the motorcycle has laid himself down on a slide and he is going down, he's sliding now, and I don't know how fast he was going, but probably somewhere around 60. And he's sliding up underneath this rock truck And just when I think he's gonna get underneath the trailer and clear it, two axles of the rock truck roll over this this man. I pull up on this and I am dazed and confused because I have, I'm I'm trying to piece together what I just saw. It was horrific. And, And you just wonder, did I really just see that? So you pull up and there was another car that was coming the other direction and they pulled up after it, but they didn't see what happened. And so we conferred, we're trying to help this person, uh, this guy and this other driver went across the street and made a phone call to 911 and ambulance just came out and you know the rest just kind of happens as an accident does. They took him off the hospital. I had no idea what in the world was going on. Police arrive and so they take a statement from me and next thing I know, a couple months later, I get a call to be deposed. And so I go and I'm answering questions for the lawyers and I'm uh, being deposed because there's now a lawsuit and there's a there's a lot happening with it, but I don't fully grasp, and I still don't today, all of what was going on with it, but I knew that, that we were going to court. And so I was being deposed. I just told the truth, just said what I saw. It turns out I'm the only witness to the accident. And so the day came for the actual trial. And I remember as I was going to the trial thinking, all right, I know I'm gonna be a little nervous. I've uh, never done this before. I've never been in a courtroom at this point in time. And I'm, I'm wondering what that's gonna be like. And I just know I need to tell the truth. Just say the truth. And that's all you can do. And just just do your best to say the truth. And then you'll be good. And so I got on the witness stand, of course. And, and I'm thinking that's my strategy. Now I stuck with the strategy. What surprised me that I had no thought of whatsoever prior to this moment. When I sat down in the chair and they read me uh, the oath and I, I took the oath and, you know, I'm gonna tell the truth and all that. I had no idea what it was like being in the presence of the judge and the jury and recognize the power and the authority of being asked questions and critiqued Every single word that you use, every movement that you make, you're aware of them. I, I, I didn't recognize what it was like to be in that kind of presence. Truly, it was sobering. And I remember thinking, do I wanna use that word or do I wanna use a different word? Should I do this? I got a scratch on my ear, should I do that? What? I mean, you're, just, you're, just, you're thinking about everything. And, and it's, it's, it's a difficult place to be in. And I remember, wow. And it still sticks with me today. I can, I can feel being in that witness chair and going through that experience. It was sobering. And I think when we are gonna look at the passage today that we're gonna look at, what we need to recognize is that there's something about Jesus that we're going to see here today that we often don't necessarily zero in on. And we don't zero in on it to our own detriment. And it's very important that we recognize that in Jesus, the Messiah, that John the Baptist is gonna talk to us about, we're going to see a power, we're going to see an authority, 
we're gonna see, we're gonna see this incredible sovereignty that truly, if we, we see it, we are changed by it. And it, it evokes the uttermost admiration, adoration, and I think the word that is often used, and it's the appropriate word, is awe. But here's my problem. I don't often think of Jesus with awe. And it's to my detriment that I don't. John the Baptist is going to remind us today about exactly that. And it's important that we recognize something here too. Often when we look at the Trinity, and I've actually heard it said this way, you know, when you look at the Father and the Son, it's kind of like good cop, bad cop. The Father's the bad cop. And then you got Jesus and he's all warm and fluffy and he's the good cop. Nothing could be further from the truth. They're both God. And what we're about to learn about Jesus before we even know his name, we're gonna see a very different picture of Jesus from the warm and fluffy. Let's read what he actually has to say here. Verse 15, chapter three, everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah, John the Baptist. Now remember last week we started part one of this particular passage. John answered their questions by saying, oh, no, 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 I'm not him. See, I'm the guy who's gonna baptize you with water, earthly elements, but someone's coming soon who is greater than I, which is pretty amazing because the priests and the people of Jerusalem, they're gonna recognize Jesus as a great prophet. They're willing to go there, but they're not willing to admit he is the Messiah and they are not willing to admit he is the son of the living God. But John is saying, you see me as the greatest prophet. Well, I want you to know there's one who's coming who's greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with the winnowing fork. We described this last week. Uh, When you have wheat and you're threshing wheat, you're trying to get to the kernel of the wheat. You have to separate it from the the, the actual shell, which is the chaff. And so you kind of throw it up in the air and the wind blows and it creates two separate piles and you're able to get rid of the chaff, but keep the kernel of wheat and make food with wheat. He's ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing floor, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with severe fire. And so when we see this, what we're recognizing, we introduced this last week, is that from the beginning of Jesus' story, we don't even know his name yet. This was always more than an intellectual pursuit. It's about where you place your faith. It's more than just what I think. It's about what I it's about what I bring to God. It is literally the, the, the fulfillment of, uh, of Deuteronomy 6. And when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, oh yeah, easy one. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He didn't say, just love him with your intellect. Yeah, woo, think good thoughts. No, he said, you need to bring absolutely everything you've got to him. And that's the greatest commandment of them all. In fact, if you, if you do that, you really can't go wrong because all of the commandments are backing that one up. They're gonna help you arrive at that literal place. And so we put our faith in Jesus for the rescue on a daily basis because daily I am, I am tempted to walk down that road and Jesus says, you know, that's not where I want you to go. I need you to trust me here. Put your faith in me that your best idea that you think going down that road is a really good idea and you're gonna get what you want I need you to trust me here. Put your faith in me that that is not going to give you what you want. In fact, you're gonna end up in a place you never intended to go and it's gonna cost you way more than you ever thought you'd have to pay. Trust me, trust me. Put your faith in me. This is what Jesus is doing and we know that it's more than an intellectual pursuit. It's not about my best idea overcoming God's. It's about putting my faith in God's idea. 
And so this is what we realize, and we realize that faith, it affects absolutely everything in my life, everything. It affects my finances, or it should. It affects the thoughts I think, or it should. It affects my actions, or it should. It affects the people that I am with and how I am with them, with them whether they're following Jesus or not, or it should. It affects my career path, my job, what I do there, what I don't do there. It affects my education, my, 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 what I do as a student, whether whatever I'm in, if it's high school, junior high, <laughs> or if I'm in college or trade schools, whatever. It affects all of it and so much more. My faith should affect all of those things. And we, we know, we know that Jesus came so that we could see all of these commandments lived out in his life. And then he calls us, follow me, live out your faith with me. And we know that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were really good about just living intellectually. Or they were really good at that, but they did not bring their hearts to God. And literally, they didn't have anything in them. Nothing to bring to God in that way. They just brought their actions and their obedience. They were literal Pharisees and Sadducees, these priests of the temple who could claim they had never broken one of God's law from the Old Testament. They could say that. They made those claims, some of them. And Jesus said, yeah, yeah, you're all dead inside. In fact, this is how dead they were. They were so intellectually committed, but so lacking in their heart and every other part of them that literally as God is before them in Jesus, they didn't even recognize the God that they are supposedly the priests of. Think about that. That's how far from God they were, even though God had their intellect, but he did not have the rest of them. And so yeah, it all connects together in amazing ways, and our faith needs to follow this. The honest question we've asked ourselves this last week is what part of following Jesus is faith for you? And I hope you pursued that question. If you didn't, today's a good day to pick it up. And if you did pursue it, then here's what I know. Good things started to happen for you. Because, because as you start pursuing that, God's work begins. Oh, it begins afresh and anew, and he is able to do what he needs to do. Here's where I wanna go for today is from the beginning of Jesus' story, it was more than what we can see with our own eyes and touch with our own hands. We are literally engaging with the Holy Spirit. As great and as influential as John had become, we recognize, he recognizes, hey, all I'm dealing with is water. These are just earthly elements I'm talking about. We're talking about water, we're talking about dirt. That's all this is. But the one who's coming is gonna deal in the Holy Spirit, literally the presence of God, the eternal things, not just the Holy Spirit, but fires. And we're not talking about earthly, temporal, uh, elemental fires. We're talking about the fires that are the final words, the final judgments, the final authorities of God. That's what those fires represent. That's what that is, which is why he gives the illustration of the threshing floor and the end of that whole pursuit and that action. It's important we recognize that the Messiah is gonna bring the eternal kingdom, truly. Not figuratively, but in reality. And if you think, oh, I just can't intellectually get there, then you're not being honest with what you're reading here. Because this is what you're challenged to believe. This is Jesus' challenge to you and to me that he is bringing the eternal kingdom. And no, we are not citizens of this world first. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. He has my heart first and foremost. And that is exactly what he asked for. That is his claim and he asked for no less. But we need to understand that when, when John the Baptist describes the Messiah before Jesus has been baptized and dubbed so as the Messiah by John, it's gonna come, but we're not there yet. He's gonna say, this Messiah will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Let's recognize what Theophilus, the, the, the receiver of this letter, and, and the first century hearers, what did they understand that to mean? Now we hear, oh, the Holy Spirit's gonna come to us, and we say, yay, that's wonderful. They were terrified by that thought. 
And they had good reason to be. Because if you think about it, the only experiences that they had with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament were all terrifying experiences. When God shows up, we're talking about this incredible holy moment that literally overrides everything else and the awe that comes with those moments. Think about it. Moses and the burning bush evokes this presence of holiness from Moses. He's ripping off his shoes. He's just like, what am I looking at? It was life-changing for this guy. When you think about the Holy Spirit as it's leading the presence of God and the Holy Spirit, they are the same thing. They are synonymous. We're going to talk about the Trinity in a moment. But when you think about the presence of God as it led the people out of Egypt into the promised land, they had to go through the desert for 40 years, you know, because they rejected God, but, but they rejected his promise. They didn't, they didn't want all that good stuff. They're like, no, we're afraid of it. So for that 40 years, the presence of God was with them in a pillar of cloud and in a pillar of fire, and they were terrified by it. Stay away from that. Don't walk up and go, wow, this is cool. They're not bringing marshmallows to that thing. That's not how that's going down. The mountain of God, the presence of God, they literally set up stones around the mountain. Why? Because they said, God told them, if you walk across that stone, if you cross this line, you or any of your animals, they are going to fall down dead. To be in the presence of God is a completely terrifying experience for them. You think about the holy of holies that the presence of God was in, in the temple. The, the, the priests didn't even want to go in there. They would offer their sacrifices for their own sins and then they would walk in. They had a bell on them, a rope tied around their waist because if they went into the presence of God and they fell dead in the presence of God, they could drag him out because nobody was gonna go in for them. So they prepared ahead of time for their own death. Think about it. They hear the thud, the bell. Hey, we need to go get Larry. They're dragging his body out of there. I don't think he did a sacrifice right. <laughs> what? Anytime the Holy Spirit, the presence of God is present, it's a terrifying moment. You see it in Isaiah's throne room scene. It's a terrifying moment. And this is what, this is what the people of the, of the first century, the people going to John, this is what they're hearing. The Messiah's gonna come. And he's not gonna just deal with water and dirt. No, 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 no. He's gonna deal in the Holy Spirit, eternal things. He's gonna wash you in the Holy Spirit. He's gonna immerse you in the Holy Spirit. Wait, you mean the same presence of God from the Old Testament, all that we learned? How is that gonna work? Because I know me and I can't stand in that. If I cross that line, I already know what's gonna happen. Is this making sense to us, church? Before Jesus is ever introduced to us as warm and fluffy, the cuddly little bear, he is introduced to us as the all, awe-inspiring, sovereign God. And you and I would do well to remember this. This is who we know Jesus as first. And the friendship piece of Jesus, which is absolutely real, is built on that foundation. And the question I would ask you is, do you know who your friend is? This is who we are meant to understand Jesus to be. This is why Luke writes this, because that generation needs to hear it, Theophilus needs to hear it, and he wants to make sure in no uncertain terms that Theophilus, the recipient of this letter, understands it because it will affect and change his life. Everything about it. And it draws out a faith in the hearer like no other moment can. The sobriety of being in that presence, that power, that authority is life changing. It's eternity changing. And therefore, at the end of Jesus' ministry, 
on the night he's betrayed, about to go to the cross. So that's gonna happen next week. In John chapter 14, he tells us about the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And he says, if you love me, disciples, obey my commands, obey them. That's how you're gonna show that you love me. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. He will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Notice it's a he, it's not an it. It is not a force, it is a he. It is a person of the Godhead. The world can't receive him because it isn't looking for him. They don't care, they're not looking for God's truth. And it doesn't recognize him when he, when he is literally before them, like the priests, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. He lives with you now because he's in the presence of Jesus. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. It's not what I do to you. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me since I live. You also will live. And when I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. It's, a, it's an amazing picture of the Trinity itself. And you think about the Trinity, somebody might ask, what, what are we talking about, Trinity? What we know is that the scriptures say that God is one, and yet we see here that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all distinct persons of the Godhead, but yet they are one, and as Jesus said, he is in me, I am in him, we are all one together, but yet we are separate in the baptism that we're gonna see in two weeks after Easter. There's gonna be a moment where there's Jesus being baptized, the Holy Spirit coming down as a dove, in the form of a dove, and then the Father speaking over Jesus in his baptism. You see this incredible picture of the Trinity, all three present at the same time, all three God. You see, it's a mystery. My head can't get around it. But you know what? There's a lot my head can't get around. I mean, have you really honestly looked into string theory anytime lately? It's difficult to get my head around. God was like, yeah, that's easy. Let me invent this thing. There's a whole lot you and I can't get our head around. Shouldn't be too worried about it. What I do know is that God has given it to me and I believe it and I embrace it and I'm changed by it. And the Holy Spirit is the presence of God in my life. Here's what it says in John 14, 26. When the Father sends the advocate as my representative, he is my helper, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I have told you. And there's four things I want us to know about the Holy Spirit. These are very important. First one is that the Holy Spirit is the presence of God. This is very important. We have to understand that. If we don't understand that, then we will absolutely miss the impact of the Holy Spirit and his work in our life. A week ago, Friday, my family went over to uh, Aaron and Tiffany and Kovar's house, wonderful family in our, in our church. Well, I think they're wonderful. We're still trying to work that out because we uh, received a puppy from them. <laughs> and this puppy has been five months old, basically feral for five months. And they actually rescued these dogs, which is wonderful. Uh, so we took one of them as well. The rest of them are gone, so don't ask. They're all gone. But anyway, it's a Brittany, and so that means like, what? It's like dynamite, you know, these explosions of energy. He's, he's a bunch of fun. His name is Rooster. We love Rooster. And uh, uh, in fact, he gave me a gift this morning, right before I was to leave, and I didn't appreciate that. It made me late. So the Rooster is potty trained. Life's gonna be so good. We spent the entire week trying to control this dog. We've been trying to tame this feral animal who loves us. I mean, that dog just jump right up in your lap. He is 30 pounds of muscle and he is just loving on you. It's awesome and we love it. And we honestly love the dog, but we've been literally taking him for walks, which looks a lot like this and I, I feel like I've been working out. I kid you not. I'm like, I got a little, you know, guns. It's not true. But anyway, 
I have a little sore from him though, but this dog is like, so we've been using leashes, we've been using chew bones to bait him, and we've been using uh, the, 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 the kennel in order to constrain him <laughs> when we need him to sleep. Uh, we've been using these things here to tame him into control, and the day's gonna come when he will, and he's actually gotten a lot better a week later, so that's all good, but here's my problem. You don't have this problem, but I have this problem. I try to tame God, too. And I try to control him, too. And I just need you to understand the same thing that I need to understand, that we're growing to understand. You're not going to tame God. And you're not going to control him. That is not what's happening as he is in your life. If that's what you think is going on, you would be very wrong. This is the sovereign of the universe whose presence you are in and you and I would do well to remember it. And when we do not, it is to our own detriment. But when we do, the faith that is inspired by his presence. And I would ask the question again, do we know who our friend really is? Oh yeah, he is the sovereign. And then we're gonna lay, overlay this incredible invitation to friendship from God on top of that foundation, but he is never transitioning from one to the other. He is always both. He is the one who doesn't just deal with water and earth. He is the one who works with eternal things. He is the sovereign and you and I should always be in awe of our friend as we get to spend time with him because it's always, every time, an incredible privilege. Is this making sense to us? And you are not gonna tame God, which is why he continues to break out in your life and you're not going to stop the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you about what's right and about what's wrong and about what the leading is. You're not gonna stop it because you're not gonna control God. You're not gonna tame him. The best you can do is harden your heart, which will only somehow muffle the voice. But the voice is still there. And the voice is still in our generation, all of it, teaching us what's right and wrong, whether we know him or not. But you and I are the ones who walk with him. It's a mystery, and yet it's as plain as day. What we need to understand about the Holy Spirit and what Jesus is making possible through his life and coming, who the Messiah is himself, is that he is literally the presence of God. Secondly, secondly, the Holy Spirit brings to life the scriptures for direction and application as you and I soak in the scriptures and we allow them to just wash over our minds and our hearts and we stay with them. We allow them to just wash over us and lead us. It's the Holy Spirit who's working to lead us to the applications of how those come to be. He's the reason right now that some of us are saying to ourselves, I never understood that about him, but now you're getting it in a very different way than just reading it yourself. It is the Holy Spirit who's putting, putting, putting pieces together throughout your life. Some of you are actually seeing like this Tetris thing coming down and all these blocks are starting to line up. You're like, oh, that's why. That's the Holy Spirit doing that work in your life. He's bringing the scriptures to life which is why we are meant to hide them in our hearts so that we can live by them. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit is present with you for relationship, interacting with you. He's gonna keep talking. You know, people will say, I just don't, I just wish I could hear God. Really? I wanna just say, honestly, I wish I could go on a national network and somebody say that and I would just tell them, seriously? Because he never stops talking to me. It doesn't ever stop. And I promise, I'm not a schizophrenic. (laughs) Holy Spirit's presence is always talking. He's always inspiring. He's always leading. He's always showing you the next step. We're just saying no. Or we're saying yes. 
And I'm grateful to a whole lot of people, part of Heights Church that are saying yes and leading in to the direction of the Holy Spirit for your life. And I know already it's making a difference in you and your stories are the ones that we continue to tell of transformation in the work that God does in you. And the fourth thing we know about the Holy Spirit is that it brings conviction of right and wrong. It simply shows us the Father's heart so we know where to go. We know where to go. So when Paul speaks to Timothy about his church in Ephesus, he says this, there are people among you that will act religious. Oh, they got the intellect down, but they reject the power that can make them godly. They are denying his power. The power is the Holy Spirit who is inside of you, empowering you to live out what you now know is right and now wrong. It's the Holy Spirit you and I need to be interacting with, which is Jesus, which is the Father. They are all the same. It's a big mystery, and yet it is true. And it's the Holy Spirit has been given to us for this. And then the last part of this, I love this, and it says he will not only work and, 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 and baptize you with the Holy Spirit, but he will do it and with fire, which is the final eternal judgments. Jesus is literally the point on which the final judgments hinge. The Revelation 19, 20 moments that we see in scripture, those are predicted right here, this moment. And he's telling us right away, hey, all this, the Messiah is coming. And guess what? The day is going to come when the final judgments are going to be handed out because the father will give the son the authority to hand out those judgments to make those final decisions for the life you and I chose for ourselves with our free will. And no one could say, oh, God made me do it. He didn't make you do it. I chose it. I chose it. And yet this God, this sovereign, this awe-inspiring creator who's terrifying is offering me friendship. It's a mystery. And yet I'm supposed to get my head around it because that is what Jesus is gonna teach us as he is here with us. From the beginning of Jesus' story, it was more than what we can see with our eyes and touch with our own hands. We engage with the Holy Spirit. The fires are the final judgments. The great judge, he will judge. He will do what he needs to do. The scriptures are clear that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's the picture of God awe-inspiring and then a person and the choice that we will make to lean into it or to reject it. Well, I find wisdom in the moment, recognizing that every word I say, I'm recognizing every movement that I make, these are things that I need to pay attention to in the front, in the presence of these authorities, of his authority. I will live my life differently if I can understand truly who he is. My intellect will be engaged. My faith will be exercised and my reliance on the Holy Spirit will be necessary. He is God in all of his glory and power and I am his fallen, broken, now redeemed, restored creation. You and I would do well to listen to John. You and I would do well to do what other people who met Jesus, understanding him in this context, would have no doubt asked themselves, who is this? What is he? And you can't ask that without asking ourselves, who am I? What am I? And in light of that, what's being asked of me regarding the life that I have free will choice to live, will I surrender my, God, my life to this God whose ideas have to be better than mine? Will I chase the thoughts of God for me or am I gonna reject those? These are all really good questions that yes, you and I should be asking ourselves. Before we wrap up, I think it'd be good for us to recognize that if you were to take John's words, here's what he's really saying. You could, or I should say, you could say it this way. 
Hey, those of you who are coming to the rivers of repentance, or you see a friend coming to the rivers of repentance to be baptized here today, humble yourselves, for the day is coming when you will be humbled. Humble yourselves, for the day is coming when you will be humbled either in this life or the eternity to come. It's a problem. So many of us, we get so fitful that we don't see justice in this generation. And I get that. I get fitful too. We're being reminded that the great judge, he will bring justice for all of the injustices that have taken place. So a couple of questions and we're gonna pray. Challenge. How can I engage my faith and engage with the Holy Spirit daily? Because I get to. This is what will bring transformation to our lives. Because now we are not dealing with water, another cleansing, another washing. I've washed my hands enough in the sink. I need the cleansing that only the eternal Holy Spirit can bring into my life. Is this making sense, church? Have I despised wisdom and God's instruction? And you know if you have. Let me ask it again. Have I despised wisdom, God's heart, God's instruction? And will I humble myself before God? Because if I don't, sin is going to humble me. Father, as we come before you, what we recognize is that John brings a very important message to us about the coming Messiah that we know is Jesus. That he is the son of the living God. And if we're honest with ourselves, we have to recognize that in light of these scriptures and the light of scripture itself, that is a terrifying prospect to be in his presence. Help us to understand this more at greater depths and levels because it will only help us to walk with greater wisdom for our life. I pray, Lord, that you will help us now as we think about engaging with you and your presence in our life, that we will not reject it, but we will invite it and we will make a way for it. We will make a place for it. And recognize that it is the awe-inspiring God who's drawing us into that conversation. And even though it's a mystery and it's so hard for me to get my head around, This awe-inspiring God invites me to the foot of his throne as a friend. There's part of me that understands it and part of me that doesn't. But I'm going to take it on faith that you've asked me to come to your throne under these circumstances. If you're online with us today and you know what God's speaking into your heart right now, there's an area of your life that you need to respond in faith. You just drop that in the link. Don't tell us what it is, but say, that's me. And I wanna pray for you in just a moment. If you're here present with us and you say, you know what, that's me. There is something. The Holy Spirit is already doing that work. He's showing me right, wrong. He's inspiring me this way. He's leading me in this way. There's something I know I need to do. I need to confess this. I need to confess that. Maybe that confession is faith for an aspiration of something way past anything I could do on my own. But hey, my friend is the awe-inspiring God. So if you're here and you know God's put something on your heart and you want to respond to it, would you just lift a hand right now because we're going to pray and I want to include you in that prayer. Is anybody with me on that? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. Hold them up high. Proud. Father, we are here before you. And our hands are high because you have spoken to us. You've revealed it. And Lord, our faith is coming to a fever pitch at this point when we truly recognize who you are. 
And I pray, Lord, that you will now or inspire us with that next direction. I pray that you will fill us with whatever it is we need of surrender or healing. You will lead us to, Lord, humble ourselves. You'll show us how to do it and who to do it for and with. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is here to lead us and to bring your scriptures to light and to lead us into all truth, your truth, your heart. Because Father, as your followers, we just want to follow you well and be obedient. Here on this Palm Sunday, we recognize that we want to be the ones that recognize just who you are. Yeah. Even though the city would say different. If you're here today and you say, today's the day I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. This is the day I want to make that declaration. If you're with us online, there's a link uh, popping down. I want you to click that as you make your declaration. If you're here with us, I want all of us to pray this prayer together from our hearts. Oh God, I, I thank you that you have offered yourself to me, offered salvation to me, offered forgiveness to me. And I ask that you would forgive, that you would wash my mind and my heart clean, not just with water. It's only going to go so far. But truly with your presence, your Holy Spirit, which goes as deep as I am. Thank you for doing that work. And I pray for that healing and restoration that I will continue to stay surrendered for you to finish that work. And I pray, Lord, now a prayer of thanks as I am grateful that your Holy Spirit is in me, guiding me, and now, as your scriptures say, a deposit of the eternal life to come. Thank you. I choose to be a follower of Jesus today. And if these are our prayers, can we all say in one voice, amen? Amen, amen and amen. Giving is one of the greatest joys that you and I can experience in life. And I love how we are promised in scripture in the book of Luke, that our gift will return to us in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. It actually says running over. And that's the awesome reason why you can step into giving here at Heights Church. And by supporting Heights Church, you and I have the privilege of stepping into the miraculous work that God is doing in the lives of others. I mean, when we think about it, God is our great provider. He has given us everything that we need. And we get to give a portion of that back so that miraculous work will continue in the lives of others. By giving to support Heights Church, you are actually helping to provide many wonderful opportunities, such as creating a safe place for our kids to learn about Jesus. Yes, and bringing students a sense of purpose and belonging through all of our student ministries that we offer here at Heights Church. We get to see people's spirits lifted higher as they engage in our Sunday worship service, either at part of our online campus or here in person. We're actually watching God's word come alive as we learn about its meaning for us today in our Sunday messages. And also we get to open doors for meaningful connections and friendships through our life groups. And we're touching lives overwhelmed by fear, by grief, by addiction and hopelessness. And we are helping to transform them and helping people to experience peace, hope and joy through the restoration ministries. You and I can leave a legacy literally for eternity as, as we see lives changed forever through the church. Will you pray about what God would have you give today? I know that he wants to bring the joy of giving into your life and see lives transformed through you.